What's up, guys? This is Charlie from Malevolence, and you're watching Sonic Perspectives. Shit, musket, reject the hat of betrayal. I'm not being offered the right of myself. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another interview of Sonic Perspectives. I'm Rodrigo, and my guest today is Charlie Thorpe, the drummer of British band Malevolence. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thanks for yeah. having me. Yeah, well, you just finished a tour in the US. Uh, there are shows booked for the European festivals later this month. You have a new EP coming out. Uh, busy time for you guys, right? Yeah, it's been nonstop. To be honest, we've been on tour for about uh, seven months out of the last nine or something like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, and obviously the release came in the middle of that, the aggression sessions, the three-way split with Die Art is Murder and Fit for an Autopsy. Mm. Um, so yeah, we've just been grinding, to be honest. It's been it's been hectic, but um, I think it's like, careful what you wish for. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, tell me about the EP, uh, the aggression sessions that you just mentioned. Uh, a split EP. Uh, what drove you guys to split the EP with Die Art is Murder and Fit for an Autopsy? So they'd done one before, and it's like a series, I think. And um, yeah, we we just uh, replaced another band on that that original one, I think. I think those guys did it before uh, the depression sessions. Okay. Uh, correctly. Uh, yeah, we just we just got hit up by those guys, and uh, uh, yeah, we gladly gladly took the offer. Yeah. Um, Good stuff. I like I like the format too. There's one new song from each band and one cover song for each. Uh, and you guys picked Left Outside Alone from Anastasia. Tell me about that. <laughs> okay, first question. Have you heard that song before? The original? Uh, I have, but I know, like, I'm in Canada. I know that in North America, nobody knows about Anastasia. So. Right. Yeah. See, we only found out that afterwards because we thought it was like a worldwide banger, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because she's from America, I think, Anastasia. Yeah. Yeah. We just assumed, she, yeah, she conquered the world with that song, but then not after till we till we put put it out, uh, we realized yeah, American people just don't know it. Yeah, the uh, cra crazy yeah. thing though, I'm from Brazil originally, and I had heard of Anastasia before in my homeland, but not here in North America at all. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> weird. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's a song like we grew up listening to on the radio and stuff, and we just thought it was hilarious. Yeah, and um, like it was. There's like there's like a bunch of pop songs that we sometimes just just think. Imagine if like Com was singing that, and we had like a more like a metal song behind it, or like a sludgy a sludgy riff behind it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and that was like one of the main ones. So we we thought they asked us to do a death metal song, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we felt kind of bad afterwards because they did like uh, <laughs> kind of a corpse and then at the gates or whatever. But we thought we just uh, do one a bit more outside the box and uh, just went for a pop song. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah. But we enjoyed it, and we think it's a hard song. Like we do, we think it's a hard, a hard remix. What we made, yeah. so no, it came out sick. It came out great. But uh, I think the metal world can be sometimes unforgiving and like a, a little bit too serious and not embrace that. But you know, the end result this time was awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cheers, man. Yeah, and uh, I love the version of Hammer Smash Face as well, for, uh, which uh, Diarta's Murder did. I love that one too. It's a it's a hard one to cover because the original is it's just, just so unique, you know. But yeah, they, they pull it out. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, the cover was once again done by uh, Eliran Contour, who also did some of your other albums uh, and has worked with Testament Halloween creator. His work is just uncanny. I I love everything that he does. But uh, how did you guys connect with him? Uh, I can't remember in the first instance, but I think we'd seen him doing a lot of other uh, sick metal bands uh, artworks that we look up to and stuff. Yeah, he's got such a great collection of work, and um, yeah, I think we just we you know we were just picking from a, a bunch of artists, and he was up there with the best. So um, yeah, we approached him, and yeah, he, he turned around a sick piece. Yeah, yeah. Well, I loved the the cover of Malicious Intent as well. I think that's from your all your covers. That's my favorite, absolutely. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's gone down pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we, we we originally mm -hmm. uh, we used to use a guy called uh, Tom Bates for the mm -hmm. first, and we we were good. We were going to um, use him for the third actually, um, but yeah, um, we we yeah, we ended up using we 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 took the concept and then we we gave it to Eleran instead in the end. Okay. Um, which I think has has come out with a better result. Yeah. 
And uh, well, the album came out last year, your last full length. And I know you like to take a few years between uh, full length releases. Is that kind of the plan right now? Or do you guys have plans to get in the studio anytime soon? Uh, yeah, I think um, we've got uh, some demos written. Like obviously mm -hmm. we wrote a lot of songs for the last album. And yeah, there's some there's some like really good riffs and breakdowns left over from that. So we're going to, uh, you know, use what we've got, build upon that. And then uh, I think we're going to go straight back to writing as soon as we get home, to be honest. Okay. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. No rest for the wicked. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you agree, but the last album, uh, it was a massive step up in your career in terms of production. I mean, the quality of the material and your status as a band, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I reckon to be honest, yeah, we like, honestly, once we put that out, uh, we grew exponentially. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just looking back at the old albums, it's like, I think they were all great songs in the past, obviously a little bit more premature, um, but yeah, uh, I think yeah, I think it's the production that that brings it together, and then uh, also the songwriting in general. Yeah, it's more of a, yeah, obviously it's more of a refined sound and a a refined body of work from yeah. us that, that we're quite proud of now. Yeah. So yeah, honestly, trying to top it is going to be tricky. It will, it will for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll get there. Yeah, I just take a bit of time. Yeah. And coming from Sheffield, I mean, you guys had a lot of role models to embrace. I mean, Def Leppard, Arctic Monkeys, Joe Cocker, uh, yeah. many other bands. Was any of these artists an inspiration to you growing up? or? Yeah, a little bit. I think like uh, the Sheffield music scene in general is, uh, is pretty decent, especially for like like rock and indie. I think that's the local kind of, kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we used to just like... Um, we used to bump into these these kind of people. Like I remember one time the Arctic Monkeys were just like outside our practice room when mm. we were kids, and someone was like, "Oh, that's Arctic Monkeys." Oh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is probably like 2007 or something. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it's quite a small town, so obviously, yeah, everybody knows everybody and stuff. And um, yeah, it was it's a, it's a good little vibe, but obviously it's a bit different because we were always doing metal. Um, but then in that regard, it was more like. While she sleeps, and then bring me the horizon, pave it yeah. away for us. Um, but yeah, Sheffield's definitely got a, a nice, like, little scene going on, um, even to this day. Awesome. And from what I've seen, you're one of these bands that have been on the rise since the first album. Uh, honestly, we need new bands on the scene which are able to kind of headline a festival at one point. You know, you can't have Kiss and Maiden do that forever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you see like a renew in the metal audience these, these days, or not really? Um, it's hard to say to be honest because we've been playing to so many like different crowds around the world recently. Right. Um, but yeah, like um, America's America seems to be popping at the moment. Like obviously we've been playing to other people's crowds because we've been supporting. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, like uh, every, everyone just seems really responsive. We've been selling a lot of merch over here, which we never thought we would, mm -hmm. uh, which is awesome. Uh, but yeah, in terms of headliners for festivals, I know obviously like Bring Me the Horizon just did download fest i guess that's more like some younger guys doing yeah the headline slot yeah uh, in the uk so I, th I think everybody's aware of the fact that they can't just book the same uh og headliners exactly yeah yeah pe people are sort of like creeping through i guess but then mm -hmm. it, then the other ones were like metallica and slipknot so obviously you've still got your classics i guess you, you couldn't just flip it on its head could you because yeah all the all the old fans would just be just be angry yeah um, but yeah, we'll we'll get there anyway. We're working on it. Fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> like crossed. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know if you see it that way, but I notice a divide between like old school fans and new school fans. I, I don't see fans of Black Sabbath or Deep Purple being fully open to a band like Malevolence, for example. Oh, really? Or or fans of you guys embracing the band, the older bands, right? Yeah, I mean we I mean we came through listening to Black Sabbath, for example, mm -hmm. and we've got a lot of friends like that are our age back home that that love Black Sabbath um for one okay um, so yeah yeah i don't know i'm i'm not too I'm not too sure but um i don't know i think um yeah people like a bit of everything yeah a lot a lot of metal fans are are closed minded sometimes but i think i think as as time goes on people are becoming more open minded in general yeah personally and like we said before, I mean, this year is as busy as it gets for you in terms of touring. Uh, how comfortable are you, are you with life on the road? I mean, I've seen musicians do this out of necessity, but not yeah. really enjoying it. Oh, it's a roller coaster. It's up and mm -hmm. down. Like, uh, 
This tour, for example, we're in those bargains. Do you know about those ones? So it's kind of like a tour, but a bit smaller, but it's a bit bigger than a caravan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's pretty fun. It's a really nice setup in there, but then it's just like when it starts driving at night, it's very, very bumpy. So I think if you're a, you know, if you're a deep sleeper, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. But if you're a light sleeper like me and our guitarist con, um, yeah, we just get pretty tired a lot of the time. But yeah. then like, as long as you don't have to get up too early, you can just sleep in a little bit late. And once once it pulls up and it stops bumping, you can have a rest, and it's not too bad. But to be honest, I was perfectly happy doing um doing a van and hotels and just uh okay saving a bit of money and um you know grinding a bit hard because uh yeah I kind of like that. But I guess because this tour is seven weeks, for example, it's it's a lot. It's a long yeah. time to be to be you know trying to check in at to motels at like in the morning and then get up at six in the morning yeah you, you, it catches up with you very fast and yeah the fatigue sets in so you need to be resting yeah and um yeah eight hours of uh REM sleep is key <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think um, you know the the physical toll that it takes on on a musician like that I mean you're dealing with uh, a lot of travel time a lot of idle time as well the eating yeah. habits it's compromised right uh, yeah, it does take a toll on your health. Yeah, we've been working hard, like trying to look after ourselves. Like me and me and a couple of others have been been training proper hard, like jogging, going to the gym where we can. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I mean, it, it really helps you sustain it, especially at this age. Because when we were younger, we used to just just go hard and just drink every day and just <laughs> part, just you know just party as hard as we could, and yeah. you, you just bounce back when you're like early twenties, I think. But now, obviously, like I've just turned thirty. Uh, I think Josh is the youngest at like 28 and he, he still has a few shandies but um, <laughs> yeah the rest of us the hangovers hit way harder now so that you've, you've got to look after yourself a bit more yeah and also like the, I think the like the show is difficult as well like we put uh, a lot of effort into the shows to make it as best we can and like the technical ability needed to to, to sustain a sick show for seven weeks yeah. It's like it's like at the tip of my ability, my my playing these days. So yeah. I have to be on point with it. And if I'm not fit, so yeah, I remember I used to smoke cigarettes and everything. I like, don't mm -hmm. do none of that anymore. And uh, yeah, it's it's way easier when you look after yourself. That's it, really. Yeah. Well, it's a workout, like playing exactly. an hour of material, right? Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. You'd be <laughs> some serious calories. I always come home from tour these days, especially if we've been hitting the gym. But like my shoulders are all like way more ripped than than normal. <laughs> I'm just like. Right. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that for, as a little win. Yeah, and uh, if I may ask you, what it, what were your influences as a drummer growing up? Um. Ah. Oh, so we've got Dave Lombardo from Slayer. He was Good a big start. One. Chris Adler, <laughs> uh, obviously Joey Jordison, Igor Cavalera, and I used to always watch this this death metal guy called Derek Roddy. Oh yeah, you remember him? He was from Hate Eternal. Yeah. Um, didn't he audition for Dream Theater? I think he was in the Dream Theater documentary. Have, yeah, yeah, you might be right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just remember I used to have like one video that I downloaded off LimeWire. This is like pre YouTube, right? And, and it was just like shred into his album or something, just doing like insane blast beats. And I, I remember just watching that and it completely blew my mind. I was like, how does this guy play yeah. so fast? Yeah, and then, he's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was where I discovered blast beats, I think. But then before then, it was just like trying to play along to the nineteen ninety nine self titled Slipknot album. Okay, so, uh, Odison, R.I.P. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I noticed also that the band has their own label. Uh, I mean, was this born out of needing creative freedom from a label, or was it a financial decision, or a bit of each? Yeah, yeah, a bit of both, I guess, because um, it. It was around the, the time of lockdown. I remember like the idea was sort of there for a few years, but we never sort of dabbled with it. We went down, um, we did did a, a sort of like independent German label for hardcore called Beatdown Hardware with the second album. Mm -hmm. But we'd already discussed self-releasing um, at that point. But it's actually a good job we didn't because I think we really didn't know what we were doing with it at that point. So then it was not until about 2019 and I joined uh, our, our, our old friends band, Desolated, and um and then we, we we needed a platform to put their record out so so then created the label and then we bearing in mind that we had a, a malevolence ep about to come out as well um so that was not until 2020 so then basically we had about two eps on it at that point mm -hmm. um, but it, 
it, it was very beneficial actually because like bigger labels they, they just weren't really interested in us at that time with malevolence um yeah we'd been we'd been working hard and playing six shows but sort of like the industry was kind of um um sort of overlooking us at that point okay uh, which is interesting but um yeah and then obviously like a year later um it was it was kind of the point where where um they did the download pilot fest that was like a real pivotal point for us because we'd put yeah. our self uh we'd put our ep out on our own label and like we were making a few waves without like any management any label backing us and stuff like that and then um yeah that was that was like because the uk opened up in covid before before europe did and then it was all uk bands on that download pilot fest mm -hmm. and then loads of like um label guys and managers and stuff uh came to see us that day and we just like tore it up massive circle pit and then and then we got a booking for bloodstock in the uk a, a week after and then we smashed that one as well and then ever since then that seems to be like a real like turning point for us and it's just been like a steady incline ever since and that and then obviously like nuclear blast got in touch and stuff and then we we partnered the our label they let us keep our label mm. for malicious intent but then we did a did like a partnership with Nuclear Blast, and uh, used all their team and stuff, which was like super beneficial, very very helpful compared to back in twenty twenty in lockdown when I was um packing orders with my bare hands in my living room with boxes piled <laughs> up to the ceiling, and my girlfriend and my housemate absolutely hated me because there was merch <laughs> everywhere in the house. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, they were good times, man. testing times, but good ones. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the bigger differences between you guys and, you know, when it all started, like these Black Sabbath, Motorhead, all these other guys, is that you have a, a sense of the business side of things that is much more accurate than the guys that started before. Uh, that's out of necessity, I think, because nowadays the margin, margins are much smaller and, you know, everything's tighter. So you need to be on top of it, right? And it, it does pay off because having that independence uh, you know, it's, it's to your advantage, right? For sure, yeah. I find when you're operating with no sort of like um, manager or booking agent or any of that, and, and it's you're doing it super DIY, mm -hmm. like it's very hands on and it's very difficult. But it's like a, it's a more profitable margin at first because like once you jump into the bigger pond, the the costs rise with it. So until you get those bigger guarantees, you get stung on a lot of costs and stuff, and it's actually quite difficult to make money at the beginning. Yeah. But but then like sort of like with with uh, my other band we can just we can fly out to Europe and do a festival and like a small guarantee, and um the, you know just get some flights and just bring bare minimum, <laughs> just start, sell a bit of merch there and, and don't have to pay anybody any commission, and you can come home with a bit of a bit of pocket money. I mean yeah. obviously, when you when you're talking a career and longevity, then um yeah the big pond's the way to go. But you know if it's a if it's not that serious if it's a hobby, then yeah. DIY, I reckon, is yeah. the answer. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I noticed is that you have some very interesting, very creative merch items, and you even have your own sauce, right? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also a must, I think, these days, if you want to be commercially successful, to be creative with the merch, right? Who's behind all, all those ideas? Oh, Wilkie's the guy for that. Mm. Yeah, he, yeah, he's Bass player, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. His, yeah. his creativity is unmatched, to be honest. Yeah, he comes out with some some crazy ideas. Don't know where he gets them from, to be honest. But um, yeah, he's he's just got a bank of ideas that, yeah, he brings to life, and um, yeah, he smashes it with that. But yeah, the sauce the sauce was a good one actually. That was um that's a guy called Tubby Tom, mm. who's got a really nice uh, sauce brand. Anyway, um, it's like on the shelves in supermarkets back home, and um, yeah, he just hit us up uh, one day and was like, "Do you want to do a collab?" And we we're like, "Oh, maybe." Maybe and then we then we did it and yeah people love that stuff. Then we did a second version, I think. Awesome, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and uh, you played together since high school, I think. Uh, do you think right. that plays plays a part in the stability of the band? I mean, there hasn't been any lineup changes since the start, right? You've really done your research. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, we started in like um, primary school, which is like um, you when you're like eleven years old, twelve years old. Yeah, and it was basically me and, and our bassist Wilkie and um, a, a kid called Matt who um, who left us a little bit a little bit further down the line. But um, yeah, we we didn't get the the solid lineup till about two thousand and nine. Mm. But obviously, we started like we played the, like the school assembly, 
um and and Alex our singer was like in the year below us um all the way through school uh, yeah and he didn't join till 2009 but he was in the assembly and we, that must have been like 2004 you know all the kids cross legged sat on the sat on the floor I think right. we played white stripes you know seven nation army okay basically like the most simple song i think we might have played smells like teen spirit as well okay <laughs> but yeah, yeah just some just some basic entry level songs you know and anyway right. yeah so that was like the the very first starting point and then um yeah it's been a it's been a very steady incline every year since then <laughs> right just a little bit more a little bit better every year and then here we are 30 years old still yeah. doing it <laughs> yeah well, last question before I let you go. Have all of you guys in the band left your day jobs already or not? Not yet. Um, no, not yet, because <laughs> we're grafters. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> I think we like a bit of stability and normality when we get home. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, I feel like we might be on the brink. I think Conan, he, he he's a busy, busy lad. He does a lot of stuff. Like he's always building something or building someone an amp or, you know, messing with a big pile of wires. Um, so he, he said he was going to quit his job, but <laughs> I think, I think his, his mindset is just like too hard working. I think he'll, ne I think he'll never quit. Right. Right. Speak, but, um, well, he, he's wound down his building job a little bit, but now he just fiddles with more wires. Okay. <laughs> and then me, well, and, me, and, me and Wilkie do the, the label and Alex does a bit of security and Josh mm -hmm. teaches guitar. So, um, so yeah, not quite, but I think we, we might get there. Okay. Well, fingers crossed that if it's for the good of the band, that happens soon, sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. Yeah, hopefully we can just uh, get rid of everything and just, just focus on writing sick riffs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, Charlie, thank you so much for the interview. Like I said, I'm in Toronto, Canada. I hope you guys make it to these shores at some point in time. So, but oh, yeah. thanks for everything. Yeah, Rodrigo, thanks so much. No worries, man. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.